A Zelda game without bosses is like a burger with only meat in it. And don't get me wrong, down here in Texas, we're big on meat. But where's the melty cheese, the succulent bacon, the freshly chopped jalapeno peppers? Zelda bosses are what give the Zelda games their unique flavors, and any fan of the franchise can relate to that. With my recent two-part Tears of the Kingdom boss lore video officially wrapping up all the 3D Zelda bosses to date, it's finally time to tackle the OGs, the 2D Zelda games. And what better a game to start with than the gaming titan of the early 90s that is a link to the past. So sit back, relax, prepare to be explained upon, and oh yeah, spoiler alert, obviously. Now I will say, most of the bosses of a link to the past are fairly easily understood as either naturally monstrous creatures that were essentially placed in dungeons as bosses in order to guard important artifacts, or monsters that were created by Ganon in order to guard the maidens he kidnapped. So let's cover all of those first, starting with the bosses of the Dark World, which were most likely either created by Ganon directly or just found and placed there after being converted into monstrous dark world forms, which we'll get to a bit later. The dinosaur-like Helmosaur King is the boss of the first dungeon Link clears in the dark world, the Palace of Darkness. It's quite obviously just the biggest variant of the much smaller and much more numerous Helmosaur monsters that can be found inhabiting several dungeons of the dark world, implying they were planted there by Ganon, all of which wear helmets in order to guard their heads, leaving their backsides vulnerable to attack. However, in the case of the giant Helmosaur King, his backside looks to be pretty safe from attacks. His tail has also grown quite long, and he uses it in attacks to lash out at Link like a scorpion, though it just physically bashes enemies and doesn't serve to actually inject venom. Once Link has destroyed its helmet, its vulnerable head is exposed with a gemstone that must be attacked in order to destroy it completely. Interestingly, the boss's name in Japanese is Jikuroku, the same name as the Helma Rock King from Wind Waker, which, aside from being, you know, know, a giant bipedal bird instead of a giant quadrupedal dinosaur, shares the exact same similarities with wearing a helmet for armor that must be destroyed by Link before revealing its much more vulnerable bare head underneath. This is perhaps indicative of the Helmarok King and subsequently the Kargoroks being the evolved version of the Helmosaur King and the Helmosaurs. However, Kargoroks don't wear helmets like the Helmosaurs do, but I digress. The next monster would be Argus with two R's. Argus is the boss of the Swamp palace, also located within the Dark World, and attacks using its children. Well, that's theoretical, but listen, it surrounds itself with little enemies called Argi that, in reality, are little polyps. With Argus being a one-eyed jellyfish monster, and with polyps being an early stage of development in the life cycle of a jellyfish, and with the name Argi being extremely similar to Argus, I'm pretty sure they're actually just little jellyfish babies that must have come from the only big jellyfish in the room. Anyway, Argus and its children attack Link with physical moves, as in they physically attempt to run into Link to harm him. After all the kiddos are taken care of, Argus flies around and slams down on the water-covered floor, darting around the room in an attempt to knock Link around. There are no other copies of this enemy species located anywhere else within the game, meaning this monster either found its way to the boss room itself of the Swamp Palace, or it was placed there by someone. Interestingly, this boss also shares its Japanese name, which is Wato, with Wart, a very similar giant eyeball boss from Majora's mask that also covers itself with smaller enemies, in this case just blobs that damage Link on impact. With both bosses appearing in water temples, it could be that these species of monsters also share an evolutionary connection. The third boss in the Dark World would be Mothula, which resides within the Skull Woods and just like its name suggests, is a giant moth monster. Truth be told, there isn't much more to its existence than this simple fact, though it is interesting to note that Mothula has also appeared in several other Zelda games, both 2D and 3D, like the Wind Waker, where it appears as simply a species of monstrous moths whose development can be witnessed firsthand, as you can even see the spiky little baby versions called morths spawn directly from bigger mothulas. Even though it's non-canon, it's also interesting to note that in the A Link to the Past manga, Mothula was originally a woman that hailed from the light world who traveled to the dark world in an attempt to become the most beautiful woman alive. But of course this backfired, and upon entering the dark world, underwent a transformation into a big moth which is the next best thing, of course. The next monster is Vitreus, the boss of the Misery Mire dungeon within the Dark World. Vitreus is yet another giant eyeball monster surrounded by littler versions of itself. In this case, just smaller eyeballs that it sends out from its pool of gelatinous ooze that it sits in, which probably tastes great. It also shoots lightning at Link before deciding to try to crush him directly. Once again, the most interesting thing about this boss is its Japanese name, which is pronounced Gerudoga, which sounds very 
similar to the Dig Dogger enemy from the original Zelda, which is also a giant eyeball. It was likely named Vitreous in the English version of A Link to the Past after Vitreous Humor, which is the clear gel that makes up the majority of an eyeball. Yeah, apparently eyeball enemies and The Legend of Zelda go hand in hand. And speaking of eyeballs, we're still not done yet because the last eyeball boss of the game is known as Cold Stare and is the boss of the Ice Palace in the Dark World. This eyeball surrounds itself in a cloud, which is then encased in ice, from which it rains ice down upon Link in an attempt to kill him with ice, which sounds remarkably similar to another boss in the franchise. Once its ice shield is broken off, it splits itself into three eyeball clouds that each must be destroyed. It never appears anywhere else in the canon franchise, so there's really not much more to be said about Cold Stare. But another fun fact about the beastie would be that in the manga, its name is Cold Stone, and also it can talk, apparently. The more you know. The next boss monster of the Dark World would be Trinex, the boss of Turtle Rock. Ironically enough, Trinex is actually a giant turtle monster with its main head poking out from underneath its rock-like shell and two additional serpent-like heads that possess the elements of fire and ice jutting out from the left and right sides of the shell respectively. Once the elemental heads are defeated, the shell combusts and disintegrates, leaving Trinex shellless and legless, strangely. It can still slide around the place like a serpent, though, until being killed by Link, of course. Its Japanese name is Deguroku, which is, of course, very similar to Jikuroku, the Helmosaur King, and implies a connection between the two. Both are reptilian, quadrupedal, and protect themselves using outer shells of some kind. It also appears to have a similarity to the classic Gliok monster from the original Legend of Zelda, which is a multi-headed dragon that famously made a reappearance in Tears of the Kingdom. And this is further backed by the fact that its appearance in the non-canon A Link to the Past manga portrays Trinex as a three-headed dragon, though it's never outright referred to as Trinex in the manga itself. This means it could share an evolutionary connection to Gliox, which is pretty cool to think about. Now, there's one more boss to talk about that resides within the Dark World, but he's a bit unique from the rest of the monsters that we've talked about so far, so I saved him for the last bit of this section. The boss of Thieves Town is a darkness-loving goon whose name is Blind. Blind the Thief. I'll go into more of this in the eventual dungeon lore video, but Thieves Town is located underneath the Village of Outcasts, which is the Dark World variant of Kakariko Village. In fact, Thieves Town is also known as the Gargoyle's Domain because it's located directly underneath a gargoyle statue in the Village of Outcasts, which is the Dark World variant of the Weathercock in Kakariko. If you enter this old stone house in Kakariko, a man will tell you that it used to be the hideout of a gang of thieves run by Blind the Thief, which is a very interesting origin story for Blind. It proves that he and all of his thieves actually came from the light world and most likely used to be Hylian. However, due to his greed to steal anything of value, eventually, of course, he desired the most valuable relic in all the land, the Triforce itself. Huh, a king of thieves wanting the Triforce for himself. You know, I wonder why that sounds familiar. Anyway, Blind either discovered somehow or was otherwise supernaturally hinted at that the Triforce was resting within the Dark World, formerly known as the Sacred Realm, so at some point he figured out how to cross into the Dark World and did just that. However, as some astute fans may know, the Dark World is a magical realm one that is cursed into transforming living creatures from the light world into physical forms that reflect their true nature, which could be anything from a monster to an animal to a plant or just a random object, like this little ball dude here who claims he was transformed into a ball because he was just so indecisive and had no you know, hard edges. Even Link himself initially gets transformed into a bunny rabbit, which isn't explicitly explained, but implies that it's due to either his true nature being timid or pure. Also, um, here's a little bonus section that I wasn't really planning on doing, but I'm gonna do anyway. Uh, if you're still watching this, prove it by letting me know in the comments below what you think you would transform into if you entered the dark world. And if you are still watching, thank you. I love you. Blind the Thief, on the other hand, straight up transforms into a demon, one that can shapeshift in order to fool his enemies. However, ever since he was a human, he apparently always hated the light and would only emerge from his hideout at night, sending his goons out to rob people in the daytime. This is a weakness of his that is carried over to his demon form, and even though he initially tries to fool Link by turning into the maiden that Link is trying to rescue from Blind, he's eventually exposed underneath a patch of light and is forced to reveal his true form. He was clearly a very evil-natured man, not only proven by his affinity for thievery and his demonic transformation in implicative of his demonic true nature, but also because of his capacity for deception. In the non-canon bonus dungeon called the Palace of the Four Sword, Blind makes a reappearance and instead decides to taunt Link by transforming into his uncle, muttering the last words Link heard him say. Which is 
pretty disturbing, if you ask me. With all of the Dark World bosses out of the way, except for the final boss, of course, let's turn our attention to the Light World bosses, of which there are three, technically four. The boss says of the first dungeon, the Eastern Palace, are a group of six Armus Knights. Now, if that name sounds familiar, that's because Armus enemies have appeared in nearly every Zelda game to date, from the original title all the way to Skyward Sword. In each case, they always appear as statues that will spring to life in order to engage in combat against something they consider an enemy, usually Link. It is to be assumed that their mechanisms are technical in nature instead of supernatural, but that's speculative. The Armos Knights of A Link to the Past are simply larger versions of these standard Armos enemies. It's very likely that Armoses are Hylian in origin, since they typically appear within palaces or temples constructed by Hylians, such as the Eastern Palace in A Link to the Past. And in this case specifically, they were likely placed here to stand as a trial for anyone who would try to claim the Pendant of Courage that they guarded. They do reappear later on in the game within Ganon's Tower itself, but, you know, stealing a group of statue knights is probably a pretty easy task for the King of Thieves. The boss of the second Light World dungeon, the Desert Palace, is once again actually multiple bosses called Lan Molas. This is another reappearing enemy for the franchise, having made its debut appearance in the original Legend of Zelda. Lan Molas are monstrously large worm centipede insect things that burrow underneath the ground and resurface to attack their prey and are covered in armor, with their only weak points being their heads. For all intents intents and purposes, they appear to simply be wildlife that were placed here, again in order to safeguard the Pendant of Power, should there be a hero brave enough to attempt to claim it for themselves. As a reminder, there are three Pendants in A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds called the Pendants of Virtue that are used to prove that an individual is worthy of claiming the Master Sword for themselves, which is why they're each guarded by powerful beings, which also implies that the Guardians are placed there by design. The last Pendant, the Pendant of Wisdom, is guarded by the third Light World boss, the Moldorm in the Tower of Hera. The Moldorm shares an incredibly similar explanation to the Lanmola in that it's also a giant worm centipede insect thing that also appeared in the first game and that also has only one vulnerable spot, although this time it's on its tail instead of its head. Moldorms also make many appearances across the franchise and are usually faced as common enemies instead of bosses, making its appearance in A Link to the Past unique. Both the group of Lanmolas and the Moldorm make reappearances in Ganon's Tower at the end of the game, but that doesn't mean they're not still a wild monster species native to Hyrule, which is what I think is still most likely. Now, there is technically one more boss that Link faces in the Light World, actually before he faces any of the ones I just mentioned. Way back at the start of the game, right before Link rescues Princess Zelda from her jail cell, he has to face a formidable ball and chain trooper. Now, this is the only boss on this list that's really just a Hylian soldier, one that's located in Hyrule Castle and that's equipped with Hylian armor and a Hylian weapon, in this case, the ball and chain. However, he fights a against Link because he's been brainwashed by the mysterious wizard known as Aghanim. In order to aid the warlock in his dark quest to banish the sage descendants, Princess Zelda included. There isn't much more to explain about the guy other than the fact that it's unfortunate he was brainwashed and therefore died because of it. I mean, who knows, he might have been kinda cool before going all crazy. With all of the dark and light world bosses finally explained away, it's time to focus on the one who started it all, the King of Thieves himself, Ganon, formerly known as Ganondorf Dragmire, also known as the evil wizard Agony, his alter ego. And I'm really excited to get into it because this is one of the coolest backstories to any villain I've ever known. But to explain all of that, we've got to first rewind to before the events of the game took place. According to the lore derived from both A Link to the Past and the canon Zelda timeline, Ganondorf was originally just a man who coveted the power of the Triforce. His backstory about being a king of thieves that hailed from the land of the Gerudo is more fleshed out in the prequel game known as Ocarina of Time and the parallel game in the adult timeline known as the Wind Waker, and if you'd like a more in-depth explanation into his appearances as Ganondorf in either of those games, feel free to check out those videos after this one. However, it is still important to know that after the events of Ocarina of Time, the timeline itself and therefore Ganondorf himself split into three separate continuities. And in this case, we're dealing with Ganondorf's story after he used the Triforce of Power to transform into the two-legged pig demon known as Ganon and defeated Link at the end of Ocarina of Time and spawned the Fallen Timeline. As the story goes, following those events, the Triforce, either in its entirety or simply the pieces of power and wisdom, apparently returned to the Sacred Realm where it had originally been placed which prompted Ganon to re-enter the Sacred Realm, also known as the Golden Land, in order to obtain the full relic. It is said that his followers went with him into the Golden Land, but were killed by their leader Ganon in order to leave no challenger standing. Once the full Triforce was securely within Ganon's grasp, his evil power spread throughout the entire Golden Land, transforming it from the peaceful Sacred Realm into the dangerous Dark World. 
As Ganon went a little power crazy, transforming everything into his own kingdom of darkness, his power began to leak out into the regular light world, prompting the king of Hyrule to elect seven wise men, also known as the Sages, to seal the entrance to the dark world up in an attempt to lock Ganon and his evil away. However, before they could successfully seal the Dark Realm away, Ganon sent his new army of monsters through the gateway and into Hyrule to lay siege to the castle, leading to a war breaking out between the Knights of Hyrule and the army of Ganon, who were enhanced magically by the full power of the Triforce. Just as the forces of darkness were about to conquer the Knights of Hyrule and enter the castle, the Sages succeeded in the seal, cutting off the power of the Triforce from Ganon's army and leading to their utter defeat. This war was known as the First Imprisoning War, with the second occurring at an unknown point in time against another Ganondorf entirely with another set of sages entirely, according to Tears of the Kingdom. Anyway, as the years went by, Hyrule moved past the legend of the Triforce and the Dark World and the Imprisoning War, but Ganon did not. Eventually, he concocted a new, even deadlier plan, which began with assailing Hyrule once again with disasters. There began to be plagues, droughts, earthquakes, and fires that broke out everywhere, and the King of Hyrule tried every magic known to man in order to cease the misfortunes, but to no avail. Enter Phase 2 of Ganon's plan his alter ego known as Aghanim. Now, this is my own theory, but I personally believe that Aghanim was already a wizard of the land of Hyrule that somehow contacted or was contacted by Ganon from the alternate realm. And this contact led to Aghanim either willingly or unwillingly being possessed by a spirit of Ganon. The reason I say this is because Aghanim is faced once again at the end of the game within Ganon's tower and upon his second defeat, releases a ghostly image of Ganon that then transforms into a bat and returns to Ganon himself, waiting with in the Pyramid of Power, leaving Aghanim's physical body crumpled lifelessly on the floor. In my opinion, if Aghanim were to be just a fabrication of Ganon's magic, his body would combust like all the other monsters in the game after they're defeated. But it doesn't, which makes it more likely that the body is actually real. And thinking about Aghanim's existence this way would explain how Ganon was able to plague the land of Hyrule even though his power had been completely sealed away within the Dark World. I mean, if he had just been able to waltz through the door as an alter ego the whole time, then what was the point of the seal in the first place. However, this is just my personal theory and not one that has been confirmed on any official media anywhere, meaning you can choose to believe it or not at your discretion. Back to the backstory though, Aghanim approached the king in his majesty's desperation and offered to rid the land of its ailments using his new, unknown magic. The king accepted this proposal, and sure enough, Aghanim was able to stop the disasters entirely. This led the very impressed king to promote Aghanim to the level of advisor to the king, heir to the sages, and hero to the people of Hyrule. However, after Aghanim had risen to effectively the second most powerful political seat in the realm, he began to work behind the scenes to bring phase three of his plan into fruition, which entailed influencing the people of Hyrule through dark magic, hence the ball and chain trooper. After the pieces were in place, he killed the king of Hyrule on his throne, leaving his majesty's very own lifeless bones to sit in the powerless chair. Then he began hunting down the descendants of the sages, six innocent maidens, banishing them to the dark world world one by one inside indestructible crystal prisons in order to break the seal on the dark world and release Ganon back into the world. And he was 100% sex. And he was 100% successful in his plan until he got to his last victim, the Princess Zelda herself. Zelda, who was gifted with telepathic powers due to her goddess bloodline, was able to send a message magically to Link and his uncle requesting help, and this is where the events of the game begin. Link awakes in the middle of the night, reaches Zelda, rescues her from Aghanim's grasp, retrieves the Master Sword, then returns to Zelda to find that Aghanim has already captured her, and confronts the wizard in Hyrule Castle where he discovers that he was too late and Aghanim has already banished Zelda to the Dark World. Link then fights against Aghanim for the first time, but before he's able to defeat him, Aghanim escapes into the Dark World, bringing Link with him. At this point, Aghanim takes a very passive role until the end of the game, awaiting Link's arrival in Ganon's tower. When Link arrives, he's finally able to defeat him, revealing the spirit of Ganon that was possessing Aghanim's body, which transforms into a bat and returns to Ganon within the Pyramid of Power. Link spares no time at all in flying directly to the pyramid and confronting Ganon himself, and after a brief exchange with the Demon King regarding Link's fate, Ganon is finally soundly defeated by being fatally shot with a light arrow, after which Link is able to retrieve the Triforce and return the land to light. It's important to note that this is the end of the first Ganon's life, and all subsequent appearances in the Fallen timeline are due to his followers attempting to resurrect him. But we'll get to those appearances in their own videos now, won't we?
And with that, we have now completely explained every single boss in the Legendary Zelda game, A Link to the Past. Did you learn something new? Did I miss anything? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching! If you enjoyed the video, or at least my efforts into making it, please consider leaving a like to get it spread around on YouTube. And subscribe if you haven't already for much more gaming lore to come. Huge thanks as always to my Bandit crew, who make my day every day and are the reason I can continue to make videos on the channel. That's all I've got for this one, so be sure to follow me on my socials, and I'll see you next time. I've got a few other videos planned for this month, so this isn't goodbye to 2023 just yet. Anyway, this is Bandit, signing out. Peace!